right? Revelation chapter 4. Well, I certainly have enjoyed the service, the song service. I appreciate all the trouble you went to to make me feel at home with the Backwoods Brothers. <laughs> and uh, really fired me up. And then that amazing love song. How could it be? Perhaps one of the greatest songs in the hymnal. It really stirred my heart. I thank the Lord for a good week He's given us. And uh, I want to thank you for every expression of your love, the cookies and the pies especially. <laughs> and then the pastor's lovely wife has been such a wonderful hostess. She's fixed and served and Rachel's helped her and Samuel helped Rachel and Rachel and the pastor hadn't done a thing. <laughs> but we've had a wonderful time. And, uh, we've enjoyed being here so much. In the Revelation chapter number 4, and we'll begin our reading at verse number 1. <clears throat> After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither. You ought to shout, right there's the rapture. Right there's the rapture. Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne, and he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass, like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf. And the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, I want you to read that last, right, 11th verse with me. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created. <clears throat> Well, this is a beautiful heaven scene, and it shows us several things about heaven, and so I want to talk about heaven just for a few minutes tonight. And everyone in here is headed somewhere, and you won't always live here, uh, and you won't always be just like you are now. A lot of times we, we think so, and we try to get all we can and can't all we get. The truth is, we're, we're passing on. And I was just looking a moment ago, uh, really I was looking at a picture of my grandson, and I saw this, this gospel tract someone handed me in 1965. And I was a lost, wicked man working in a machine shop. And this old boy named Nick some human being was involved in your salvation. I know Jesus did it, but, but someone prayed for you. Old Nick here, he was a machinist. And uh, one day I came in, I had, I came into the factory and, and he wasn't like the rest of us. And he had an old wooden pallet that he had placed around behind the building, between the building and this bank over the water ditch. And he put that pallet back in there and when we'd have a break or a lunch hour, he'd get back there so he could be away from all the cursing and the 
rock music and stuff that we had going out front. And one day I went down, we had a big planer down there, a big metal planer, and I went down there for something, and I heard old Nick back there praying, and he was weeping. And he said, Lord, touch old Rufus Edmonston. He's wicked. He needs to be saved. And it went through me. That just went through me. So I got upset and got mad at him, and I wasn't going to hang around that religious Phariseeism, and so I quit my job. And to get away from Nick. And I found this track under my horn ring on a 56 Chevrolet. You know, they had a horn button, then there was a ring around it. That's how I got that. Nick put that under my. And I put it in that old wooden toolbox we had to use as machinists. You couldn't use a metal toolbox. And then I found it years later. So I pulled out of there. I had a relative that ran a, owned a furniture factory. And so I went down to truck for him. And when I got down there, uh, the man's name was, uh, there at Prestwood Harbor, the man's name was J.B. Same thing. And he began to pray for old Rufus. God always has someone, doesn't he? A, a little maid from another country. Or, and you ought to thank God that someone prayed for you. Someone witnessed to you, handed you a little gospel track. And you ought to be careful not to break that cycle. You ought to pass it on. Amen. You ought to tell someone else. Makes the difference in heaven or hell. Everyone here is headed somewhere. And what you do about Jesus now determines what he'll do about you a little later. I know that the flesh wants to put all the emphasis on right now. It's not the sweet by and by. It's the nasty now and now. But what about the sweet by and by? Old Dr. Rambo wrote a song back in the early 70s. He said, where will you be a million years from now? Will you be happy? Will you be singing while ages roll? Throughout eternity, I ask this question, where will you be? You'll be very much alive. And you'll have all of your senses. You know, one of the most horrible things about being lost for eternity is you will have your memory. It'll haunt you day in and day out. If you're here tonight and you die without Christ, you'll remember this service. Every opportunity that you had to come to Jesus, you'll remember it. So, oh, what a fool I've been. But the sad part is, a thousand years later, you'll still be at it. Still be at it. So I wanted to talk about heaven a few minutes. And uh, I'm not sure what I want to say about it, but let's just have a brief word of prayer. God, our Father, I thank you and I humble myself before you. I really need you to give me some direction now. All I want is what you want. And so I pray in Jesus' name and submit myself to thee the best I know how to be an instrument in thy hand like a hammer in the hand of a good carpenter or maybe a plow in the hand of a farmer. I, I need you, Lord, to guide the plow and, and to pull the plow. And, and I'm nothing, Lord, but, I, but an instrument in thy hand. But I praise you that I can be that. And so I pray you move upon us. Fill me with the Holy Ghost power and help me to be a blessing, a source of encouragement to your saints, and some direction and help for lost sinners they might come to know Christ. Thank you for this wonderful time together this past week for blessing us and challenging us and helping us. And thank you, Lord, for the privilege that we've had to try to be a blessing to your saints. Have your way now. Have mercy upon us. And have your way in this service. And I pray with Oliver B. Green, who used to say, save that soul that's nearest hell. For Christ's sake, amen. 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 Now the Bible means what it says, and it says what it means. And so in this passage, we have one of the most amazing things about this heaven scene here is, is this throne. Oh, my. It seems like everything in heaven is identified and described as to how, excuse me, 
how it relates to the throne. Do you notice that? Uh, and then I notice the worship and the joy and gathering around the throne. And, and honey, if you're saved, you're headed somewhere. And he has prepared a place for you. And as much as you enjoy being here and the wonderful relationships in your family, and I hope that you have good health, but this is a drag. This is nothing compared to the four square city of God. And uh, we're going to have time. It's going to be better there than it is here. Mark her down. And I really appreciate him showing us so much that's going to be going on in heaven. Now, I, I appreciate what's going on now. I'm a happy Christian. Uh, I have joy uh, in my life. And uh, I want to recommend him to you. He's good for what ails you. And I, I don't have any sad songs or sad stories. God has blessed us. All the negative things in my life was before Calvary, before I met Jesus. I'm, I'm being honest with you. At 10 minutes after 12 on April the 16th, 1967, he quickened me, made me alive. He anointed me to preach that same morning. I don't understand that. But God's power fell on me, and I've been trying to preach ever since. And he's blessed Joanne, and he's blessed our children, and put them in the Lord's work. And it's just a wonderful, ours is a success story. God has been good to us and blessed our children. Oh, it means so much to see your children active in serving God. And it's a wonderful thing, a miracle. Because of my background, it seems like that my family tree, I started, a friend of mine started doing a research on our family tree, found a man hanging on it, and we quit. <laughs> and, uh, and it was just... The Edmonstons, they were, they were Englishmen, and they came here, and uh, second generation then married Indians, and, uh, and then, of course, you know, that Indian and English blood, that's why I have indigestion all the time. <laughs> and, but it seemed like through the years, they just, they'd live and die and go to hell, and their children would grow up and live and die and go to hell, and just here and there, you know, there was one. Now, in 1652, the first gospel message was preached in North Carolina by William Edmonston. So he was, uh, 1672, and he was, there was just one that came here, so I'm a direct descendant. Uh, but I found out later that he was a Quaker. <laughs> but uh, uh, when I search back through there, I find, I find him just living, dying, and going to hell, and living, and dying, and going to hell. And uh, the Lord came along and saved uh, my daddy's brother. And daddy was fighting chickens and playing poker and making liquor and lived that way. And we was way back in the mountains. And the Lord Jesus saved Uncle Pete. His name was Hansford. We called him Pete. And he came to the house and wept and pled with my daddy. And so daddy started trying to reform, you know. And he said, I'm going to move you youngins out of this hill. And I'm going to quit this stuff. And so Uncle Pete said, all right, I'll get you a job. And so Uncle Pete got Daddy a job in the furniture factory there in Lenore where the Broad Hill people and the Kincaids and the Magnavox and all the, it's the furniture capital of the world. And he got my Daddy a legitimate job down there. But what Daddy didn't know was that Uncle Pete was a preaching every day at lunchtime, <laughs> every day. And Uncle Pete would preach, he'd, t he'd eat his lunch in about 10 minutes and jump upon a 55-gallon barrel and get out his little Gideon New Testament and preach like the house is on fire. And so my daddy began to get depressed and uh, began to drag around. In his 80s, I asked him to tell me about when he got saved. He said, let me tell you about how I sought after God, preceding salvation. You don't hear much of that anymore. Those mountain churches, they'd have a mourner's bench, but they'd have a seeker's bench. And when you got troubled about your soul and and you really didn't know if, if you're ready to be saved, or if, but you knew that you was troubled, then you'd come forward at the invitation and just sit down on that seeker's bench. And you were telling the whole congregation, I think God is dealing with my heart, and I don't want you to pray for me. And then they'd just leave. No one would come down and try to get them on the, on the Romans road. We wanted them on the Calvary road. Amen. No one had any little quickies, you know, or pray this prayer, or, whatever, you're welcome. And so then, but we'd watch, we'd watch them, you know, and maybe the next service they'd come and get back on that seeker's bench. 
And uh, then maybe the next service, they'd step out and folks would look and, and, and they'd get on the mourner's bench. They was ready to get in. I know y'all don't think that worked, but I'll tell you, when them boys got saved, they got in. Amen. They stayed in. Amen. Go home, pour the liquor out, kill them fighting chickens and eat them. <laughs> and so it's wonderful to be saved. And I, I want to thank God for giving me such a wonderful life. And I ain't done yet either. Amen. Amen. I don't want to refire. I, want to, I don't want to retire. I want to refire. I wrote down some things that happened. They say 70 things happen to you when you get saved. But you'll enjoy these things. It says, in Christ we have. <clears throat> Amen. Somebody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's no way to say hallelujah. Say hallelujah. In Christ we have a love that cannot be fathomed, a life that can never die, a righteousness that can never be tarnished. That's in Christ. We have a peace that cannot be understood, a rest that can never be disturbed, a joy that cannot be diminished, a hope that can never be disappointed, a glory that will never be clouded. In Christ we have a light that can never be darkened, a happiness that can never be interrupted, a strength that can never be enfeebled, a purity that can never be defiled. We have a beauty that can never be marred, a wisdom that can never be baffled, resources that can never be exhausted. Are you in Christ? Amen. You have a life that can never be forfeited, a relationship that can never be abolished, an acceptance that can never be questioned, a standing that can never be disputed, a justification that can never be reversed. Amen. We have, are you in Christ? Amen. We have a seal that can never be broken. Amen. We have an inheritance that can never be taken away. Amen. We have a wealth that can never be depleted, a possession that can never be measured, a salvation that can never be annulled, a forgiveness that can never be rescinded, a grace that can never be arrested, an assurance that can never be disappointing, an attraction that can never be superseded, a comfort that can never be lessened, a service that will always be rewarded, an intercessor who will never be disqualified. Are you in? Say amen. A hope that will never fade away, and a glory that will outshine the stars. I'm feeling a little better all the time. <clears throat> Just a word about heaven. First of all, I want to say, now this is all introduction. Don't fasten your seatbelts yet. <laughs> First of all, I want to say that heaven, just a word, it's future. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you say, honey, this is heaven on earth. No, it's not. <laughs> it's not. I don't care how sweet old sweet he is. It's not heaven on earth. Oftentimes folks say this is hell. One fellow I was talking to him, trying to warn him about going to hell. He said, man, if you live with my wife, you know I'm in hell. But hell is not here. And you know, a lot of folks think that hell is here. A lot of folks think that hell is right here on this earth. But it's not. No, no, no. And heaven is not right here on this earth. Amen. Even if you live right close in the north, it's still not here on this earth. It's something... It's something out there in the future. And then secondly, I want to say that heaven is future. Heaven is fabulous, fabulous. 15, the city of God is 1,500 square miles. And then these days with calculators and, and the advantage we have over, not math, but arithmetic, the advantage we have over arithmetic, you run that thing through a calculator. That's 175 million cubic miles. 175 million cubic miles. In other words, if you had a mansion there that was 4,000 square feet, now 2,000 square feet is a pretty good hacienda, but when you have 4,000 square feet in your mansion, there's room for 20,000 trillion mansions with 4,000 square And that's more people than have ever lived since Adam and Eve. Amen. It's future and it's fabulous and it is forever. It's not just a little temporary thing that God has schemed up just for a little while, but it's forever. Now, we can't, we can't even think on terms of forever. We, we are so tied to the schedule, but honey, God doesn't even own a clock <laughs> or a watch. It's forever. Then I want to say it's free. <laughs> There's no use in you trying to send up a few gold bricks to put on your mansion. 
John already saw it. Amen. Amen. It's free. Salvation is free. Jesus paid the price at Calvary. And so you have to depend on him. If you're going to heaven, it's going to involve him. If you're going to spend eternity with God, it's going to involve Jesus Christ. He's the only way. He's not just a way. It's no option. There's no choice. It's either Jesus or it's hell. Amen. 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 It's free. And then I want to say, it's for you. Amen. Don't let any Calvinist or any other bonehead Amen. tell you that you can't be saved. Often I speak with folks that say, oh, no, preacher, it's not, it's not for me. See, I can't, I can't be saved. They'll say, honey, don't think because you did this, that, or the other. I mean, really, we, we run into a lot of folks that's too good to be saved. But we've never met one that was too bad. Amen. The only crowd I see getting in is sinners. Now, I'm not indicating you have to be mean as a devil to get saved. But I'm just saying you'll have to see yourself lost. And that's the danger of coming up in a good, if there is a danger, of coming up and living a clean lifestyle and good environment and educational advantages and all these things, is that it's hard for you to see yourself lost. Why, you're as, if you're lost, you're as lost as you can be. If, if, you're, if you're saved, you're as saved as the Apostle Paul. But if you're lost, you're just as lost as Judas Iscariot. You're not a pretty good boy or a pretty nice girl. You're lost. You're wicked before God, regardless of what the people say, and who's who, and the best student of the year, and people bragging on you, and grandma saying you're a good little girl. You're not a good little girl. You're, oh, you're my precious little grandson. You're a prince of a man. You're a fine little boy. You're a little devil, and you know it. <laughs> and you see, it's not, you know, tall, short, fat, skinny, rich, poor, black, white, American alien. Uh, <laughs> it's either saved or lost. Right. And God sees us saved or lost. Right. And he looks on this congregation. Y'all look fine to me. Look fine. But he sees the heart and he sees us saved and lost. Right. Saved, not rich, poor, black, quiet, indifferent, interested. It's saved and lost. And everyone in here tonight is saved or lost. Everyone in your telephone directory is saved or lost. Everyone on your street. And we ought to see it that way. You know, we have so many groups that have come in. We have 250,000 Russians living over here in New York. And we have Mexicans. Well, I'll tell you down south, we got so many Mexicans. There's so many Mexicans down there now, they have their own telephone system. It's Taco Bell. <laughs> <coughs> That lady about stole my fire, didn't she? <laughs> Tell you what, let's do. And I love the Spanish people. You get saved, you love everyone. Amen. Amen. Tell you what, let's do. Let's look at these verses right here, and we might get a verse out of chapter 5. The ultimate test of a negative preacher is can he preach a negative message about heaven? I'm fixing to commence. Well, yeah. had you rather ride around in an air-conditioned Buick or walk on streets of gold? I'm going to preach a negative message about heaven. As a matter of fact, I want to preach a few minutes. If the Lord will help me, and you'll put up with me. I want to talk about some things you might not like about heaven. Some things you might not like. I'm not punning. I'm, I'm serious. Some things you might not like about heaven. You see, there's such a gross inconsistency in the Baptist church. I run into so many folk that, that say they, that they're saved, but they don't enjoy the things that we do at church. A lot of folks would tell you they're headed for the city of God. But everything about that lifestyle is contrary to their lifestyle. I don't believe they're going, quite frankly. I believe when you become a child of God, He gives you an appetite for godly things. And I believe you like the things that Jesus has arranged. Let's look 
Now, these verses, just for a few minutes, this is going to be good. I feel it coming on. Look, look down here now. I underlined, I don't know, I think, let me see. I have to count them again. I believe in this context, 16 times he mentions the throne. I mean, it's almost monotonous. It's the throne, the throne. And everything it, it, that he describes, he tells you if it's behind the throne or under the throne or around the throne, the elders are around the throne. And, and, and that's not just unique to, to this passage, but to the whole revelation. As he shows us some things in heaven, he describes things, how they relate to the throne. So I want to say the first thing that you might not like about heaven is sovereignty. Sovereignty. Someone in control. Someone telling you what to do. And so everybody wants to go to heaven. Nobody wants to die. That is, die out of self. And so everyone wants to go to heaven, but we just don't want anyone telling us what to do. You want him to be your Savior, but you don't want him to tell you what to do. Half the Baptists I run into would love for him to save them and then just leave them alone and let them live out their life the way they want to live out their life. And I'll call on you again when the death rattles set in. But there's no such Christianity described in this New Testament. But they're everywhere. Sure, you'd like to be saved, yes, and use Jesus as a fire escape to keep you out of hell then let you go ahead and live your carnal life and still go to heaven. I don't believe you can lean toward hell all your life and go to heaven when you die. Right. Right. Oh, but maybe that was too harsh. Maybe he isn't a fire escape. Maybe he's just a spare tire. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is a good used car. You need to buy this. And you need to buy this car. I'll tell you what, man, the spare has never been out of the trunk. There'll be a few car salesmen in heaven, but not many. And see, we brag on that car. Don't worry about Matt, he'll make. We brag, we brag about that car, and we describe that car as being a good one. The, the spare's never been out of the truck. And we treat Jesus like he's a spare tire, and he's there just in case of an emergency, but we sure hope we don't ever have to call on him. Or we'll use him like a crutch or a walker, and we'll put that crutch behind the door. Somebody might break a limb, and they might need that crutch. I'm glad we've got it, but I hope we never needs it. The Bible doesn't describe that kind of a Savior. Oh, no. No, there's a relationship. Once you become a child of God, you're in him. And honey, you can know when you get in him because he'll get in you. Amen. Let the church say amen right there. Amen. And there's a relationship. You don't have to come to the house of God to find Jesus. You can find him in the dishpan. You can find him in the front yard. He's everywhere and he's your dearest friend. And what a wonderful thing to have that ongoing love affair and that relationship with the lovely Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus, don't you love the Lord? And so a lot of folks wouldn't enjoy heaven because they're rebels and they don't want anyone telling them what to do. But honey, there's going to be one sitting on the throne and he's flat going to call the shots. I mean, he's going to call the shots in heaven. He's going to rule. He's going to rule in heaven. And if you're there, you're going to like it. Amen. But I mean, the bone I'm trying to pick is simply this. All authority, he said in Romans 13, all the power, and that word means authority, is God's. And so the, the authority as it's delegated and it comes our way, it's all God's authority. And so you think that you're going to heaven and you want to surrender your life to the Lord, but you won't mind your daddy. And you won't obey your mother. And you rebel against authority that's over you at the Christian school. Listen, friend, when you submit to the Lord, you submit to authority. It's not just surrender, it's submitting to the authority. And so folks say they want to go to heaven, but they don't want anyone telling them what to do. And so I, I just feel like you wouldn't, you wouldn't enjoy heaven. You, you, I'm not trying to talk you out of going. But I just want to warn you, I, I don't think you... Uh, if, you're not a, if you're not a wife that wants to be submissive to her husband, I just don't recommend. I mean, if you're not a church member that wants to be submissive to the pastoral authority, I just feel like, I mean, I want to warn you. I mean, if you're a boy or a girl and you grit your teeth and you see, you can mind without being obedient. 
Now, my mountain mama, she could handle it. You didn't have to go get daddy. I mean, she could handle it. Mama could handle it. And one of the things we enjoyed living back in the mountains, we didn't have anyone else to fight, so we'd fight one another. And there was four, there was four boys and no girls. And, uh, and really, that's a blessing because a little girl couldn't have survived in that atmosphere. <laughs> And so we were real, we were real close together. Mama had us all at home and had us just as fast as she could have us there at home. And we was real close together. And you talk about rivalry. You talk about war. I mean, and so we, we called it gang banging. And so one of us would come in and say, let's gang bang. And all of us would pile up on the floor. And I'm talking about fighting now. I'm, I'm not talking about pinching. I'm talking about what, what? And we was just, you know, 10, 11, 12, 13 years old. We was fighting it out. And it was on such a day. It was raining outside. And Mama had one of them linoleums. And she had that thing all waxed up. And we'd take off our shoes and put on them wool socks. And, man, we'd run. And you'd think you was on one of them water slides when you'd hit that linoleum. We was sliding back and forth in there. And somebody come in and said, gang, bang. And we all piled in and started fighting. I'm telling you. And there was some bleeding going on. Somebody had a busted nose. We was fighting and having a time. And Mama came in. She said, sit down, shut up. And Bobby jumped up like that. She went. And Bobby turned around and fell on the couch. And then, and then he went like this. <laughs> she said, what's wrong with you, big boy? He said, outside I'm a sitting down, but inside I'm still a standing up. <laughs> and see, that's what's happened a lot of times in our lives. We've gone through the posture we have knelt before God. We have used the vernacular. We've gone through the posture. We've said the words. But honey, if inside you're still a fighting, if inside you're still standing up, if inside you're still a sorry rebel, if inside you don't want anyone to tell you what to do, if inside you don't want to be obedient, I'm afraid you wouldn't fit in in heaven. You'd be as out of place as a catfish on the sidewalk. That's right. Amen. Amen. Some folks wouldn't like heaven because of the sovereignty. He told you to quit that job, but you didn't. He told you not to marry that girl, but you did. He told you to do something about that old filthy television that you turn on as a babysitter. From demons on Saturday morning over Dizzy World's cartoons to the filth and the vulgarity at night. But it's such a time saver and it helps you with your babysitting and it doesn't matter to you that you're raping the minds of your children. And God told you to do something about the X-rated stuff they've been written and bringing in from the video store, but you didn't. He told you to stop hiding that pornography between the mattresses, but you didn't listen. He told you, he told you, he told you to stop working down there at that store where you have to check out beer. A little dead on me in that, preacher. I, what, huh? Yeah, come on. Oh, you'll be the first in the run. Hey. Come on in. Come on in. Listen, folks. Jesus said, why do you call me Lord and you won't do what I tell you? Why are you calling me Lord? And to him that's saying, you're the boss, you're the boss, you're the boss. So he says, why are you calling me the boss and you won't do what I tell you to do? Right. He told you to give more to faith promised missions, but you didn't. You bought that camper, that boat, that car, that Mustang, that Camaro, that shotgun, or that, and you didn't do the thing that he told you to do. He told you to preach the gospel and you put him off a little while. He told you to get up and sing. He told you to go to the mission field and you're afraid that's going to mess up your inheritance. He told you to stop letting your teenagers spend the night with their lost family members. Why are you calling him Lord if you won't do? And so I'm saying some folks wouldn't enjoy heaven because heaven's a place where somebody's in charge, somebody's a calling the shots, somebody's going to tell you what to do, Clyde. You might as well mark it down. You wouldn't fit. You'd be as out of place as a catfish on the side. And then secondly, some folks wouldn't like heaven. Well, I've got to find something else here. Over in, in yeah, that's in chapter 4. Some folks wouldn't like heaven because of the sovereignty there in verse 2 and 3 and Oh, there's the throne in verse 4 and the throne in verse 5 and the throne in verse 6 and the throne three times in verse 6 because someone sits on the throne. And then some folks wouldn't like heaven because of the shouting. 
I said, the shouting. It's like when someone says, Amen. Praise the Lord. Do we think that these Pentecostal outfits have some kind of a monopoly on praise? If I believed what they believed, I'd be afraid to run and shout. I might lose it and fall and break my leg. We're the ones that have the truth. Thank God for the Baptist. If you want to hear a lie, go down to Methodist Church. They'll tell you a lie. They'll tell you you can get saved and lose it. That's a lie. Amen. Amen. You come to the Baptist Church because you want to hear the truth. Well, if we're the ones that have the truth, where is the excitement? Some of y'all right now look like you gargled on dill pickle juice back down the driveway, ran over your favorite poodle, and saw your mother-in-law coming with a U-Haul trailer. <laughs> we ought to be the happiest people in this town. I said we ought to be the happiest yeah. people in this town. Amen. We had some young folk from the Christian school years ago, and one of them got a job at a store. There's only one grocery store with two grocery stores owned by the same man that didn't sell booze. Now that's, that's unusual now. You can't buy groceries without wading through the winos and the beer. And so anyway, the man, his last name was Barber, and he was not a Christian. He said, I have more respect for my town than to sell alcoholic beverage. Not a Christian. So one of our young people got a job over there. Well, in a little while, he called the church office. He said, you got any more young people and more teenagers like so-and-so? And so the lady had me to contact him, and, he, and then she advertised on the bulletin board. You know what he said? He said, I work young folk all the time. You know, I can get them for minimum wage and work them and don't work them a certain amount of hours and, and all of that. But he said, and I'm used to young people just being normal young people. But he said, the young people from your church are happy. And the young people from your church don't take unauthorized breaks. And the young people from your church won't steal out of the cash register. And he said, the young people from your church say, sir and ma'am, and they know how to treat our customers. And he said, the young people from your church have a smile and it's real. Yeah. Listen, honey, you are some kind of an advertisement for Lehigh Valley Church. Right. You are some kind of a commercial down there where you work. I mean, he said, well, won't you come to church out there, Leo? That we love you come. And they say, is that where that uh, Orlando Garcia goes? <laughs> and the girl said, uh, yes, son, that's where he goes. And I ain't coming down there. <laughs> that's sorry. That's sorry. Thing. Now, you see, everyone here, everyone here is not like Garcia. <laughs> over the <laughs> Daniel, Daniel, they're overreacting, aren't they? They're overreacting. <laughs> but you see, they'll judge the whole church by you. John, the song leader, they will judge the whole church because you're the only one they know. And they identify Lehigh Valley with you, with you. Those of you that have businesses and those of you who witness and hand out a tract, they'll judge the whole congregation by you. Well, I'm saying, is that, where, is that where that Garcia man goes? And you see, I say, well, I'll be there Sunday because he's a fine gentleman. Amen. But you see, we ought to be happy. We ought, to, we ought to demonstrate. We ought to be the finished product. Well, when we tell people about being saved, they say, what's that? You go. <laughs> I mean, we ought to be able to demonstrate what it means to be saved. Say, so thank God, I'm saved, and I'm as happy as if I had good sense. Amen. Amen. You say, I'm saved. You say, if Jesus had loved me, he loved you. And if he'd forgive me, he'll forgive you. And if he could change my life, put my marriage back together, bring my teenagers home, get me off of that, get me off of that wagon. That's what the, that's what the drunkards call it down home. Say, where's so-and-so? He's on the wagon. Old Lewis, that wine I was telling you about, he said if they ever get in, they'll get off. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. 
Amen. Listen, friend, realize that it's important when you're a child of God and you're a member of the church, you are demonstrating what Christ can do. Oh, we all want to be right with God. We all want to be full of the Spirit of God. We all want to be saturated with the love of God because we are commercial for Jesus. Amen. 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 And so we ought to be a happy people and a praising people. And we shouldn't let this other crowd listen. When they kick that ball, or when, and I don't know a thing about it, I think, I think big time professional sports is idolatry. Now you can believe anything you won't believe. But when they do whatever they do, that crowd, oh, I mean, the stadiums that we have these days that'll seat 100,000, <laughs> they didn't design those for preaching. Listen, the big crowds today, the massive crowds in America, they're not there for the preaching of the gospel of the Son of God. They're there for a basketball or a football or a car race or something like that. And they're praising their God. I mean, they're roaring and you hear them for a mile. They're praising their God. And I am, whether they like it or lump it, I'm going to praise mine. I'm going to worship mine. I'm going to make sure that it's decent and it's in order and it's according to the Bible. But I believe we ought to praise the one that died for us amen. on the old red cross. And you might as well say a double amen. 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 You say, well, I don't, like, I don't like that racket. I don't like You wouldn't like heaven? You not enjoy heaven? We're going to be worshiping him. We're going to be praising him. You talk about emotions. We're going to be bowing before him. Some will be weeping. Some will have their hands up saying, oh, Jesus, thank you for that day at Calvary. Thank you for going through dark Gethsemane. Thank you for praying for me, Jesus. Thank you for giving us John 17, Jesus. Oh, they're going to be, they say, oh, thank you, Jesus, for heaven. Somebody else brought up in poverty out of West Virginia. They're going to say, Lord, thank you for my mansion. I've never seen a thing like it. I just want to praise you. Thank you for my mansion. Amen. Let me testify. But there'll not be anyone sitting on their hands like you did this morning, like you are tonight. Man sitting there, move me if you can. <laughs> like a poker player, no one can read your face. Don't know what you're holding. Honey, when we come to the worship service of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, all that pastor all he should have to do on Sunday morning is just direct traffic. Blow the whistle once in a while. Well, that's what it says, not over two, doesn't it? Said let them testify and let them prophesy, same thing. But said not over two, or does it say two or, two or three? Listen, we ought to be standing in line. We ought to be testifying. We ought to be praising the Lord. We ought to be having a contest to who can brag on Jesus the best. Amen. He's the one that saved us. He's the one that's kept us out of hell. Honey, if you don't like worship, you'd be out of place in heaven. Amen. 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 I mean, they're saying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. I like that. Holy, holy, holy. That's what it's all about. Do you notice that Leah Valley, how the songs are all geared to magnifying him? Most of the so-called gospel music is, is magnifying their experience. I'm going to heaven, I'm going to heaven, I'm going to heaven by and by. I'm going to heaven, and that's it. I mean, that's the doctrine of the lyric of the average gospel song. Come on, let's go to heaven, let's go to heaven, let's go. But I'll tell you when, you, when you come together and say, oh, could it be? Or when you come together and say, holy, 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 blessed Trinity, Lord God Almighty, blessed Trinity, then the, the object of our praise is not our friend, it's not our uniqueness, it's not even heaven, thank God. The object of praise, the heart of the song is the Lord himself. I'm glad I'm saved tonight, amen. amen. Holy, holy, holy. And then, and then he says, amen. All through here it's amen, amen. Over in chapter 19, there's an amen, amen. It means let it be so, let it be so. That's the kind of thing you're going to hear in heaven. It's, let's practice a little bit. Now let's, let's see, this side, y'all look a little holier than this side. Amen. amen. So we're going to say holy, holy, and then we're going to say amen over here, okay? All right, y'all not offended at me, all right? Okay, here we go. All right, let's go, let's go. 
Holy, holy, holy. Oh, that's pretty good. Now, I'll tell you what. Did y'all hear that? All right, we're going to say amen. All right, let's go. Holy, holy, holy. Amen. 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 Holy, holy, holy. Amen. Holy, holy, holy. Amen. Amen. See, that's what will be going on in the house of God. But we're standing around, we're saying, you see that car? He was a driver when he came in here tonight. He said, yeah. I said, you see that woman he had with him when she got out of there? And he said, oh, did you see how so-and-so got her hair done? And then somebody said, hey, did you see how that preacher's head was shining? <laughs> but when we come to this place, this place is not a sports bar. Boy, that deer the other day, I'll tell you that deer, why he had horns big as a pop can. He ought to have seen that fish weighed at least 22 pounds. And we talk about that, and, and did you, boy, did you see that ball game? Man, I like, and I, you know, I hope it don't rain too because I want to go bow hunting, don't you? And we carry on that, and all that stuff's good and clean, and it's all right outside. I said, it's all right outside. I said, it's all right outside. Hey, this is a house of worship. The Lord Jesus is why we're in here. This is not a sports bar. This is a place where we ought to praise the Lord, sing the songs of Zion, preach the truths of the King James Bible, and love one another. Amen. A lot of folks wouldn't like, wouldn't like uh, heaven because they don't, you know, they, they want to sit on their hands and they want to, you know, they want to, Take them a little nap. And, and I just love our pastor. He has the sweetest voice. And, and I just think I'll <laughs> sit back. And you know, folks, you become professional after a while. Some of y'all sitting out there looking right at me and you're going, and you're, you're out you're playing golf somewhere in your mind. <laughs> or you're finishing crocheting that afghan you've been working on for cold weather. Or you're making pecan pies. Boy, wasn't that good pecan pie today? Or, or you're out of here and you're, or you're, hey, you're all consumed with, with the, the job and, the, and, the, and what you have to do tomorrow. You've got such, man, you've got to get up in the morning. You've got to be there at 6.30 and you're trying your best to, and you've got all that on your mind. And, and some of you are still worried about what you left undone yesterday and we're so preoccupied with the faith of this world. We can't get our mind on God. And sometimes it's our family and it's our sick loved ones and it's, and it's the world. It's the world. It's the world. Our hearts are faithless with fear of the things that are coming up. Have you heard of what, what happened in that sniper in Afghanistan and then, oh, in Hussein Hussein. Yeah. Well, I know all that's reality, but I'll tell you, when we come into the Lord's earthly sanctuary, well, to come into this place and somehow or another, we all just have a mental blackout and just forget about the television and the news and the yeah. newspaper and just come in here and get our minds on God and get our minds on Jesus and yeah. sing Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. And somebody say, Holy, 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 amen, amen, and amen, amen, and holy, holy, and worship the Lord once in a while. Amen. So I don't like that. Well, the devil don't like it either. Why don't you identify yourself? Amen. Je listen, Satan hates the name of Jesus, especially in the context of praise. Now, when I said Satan right then, he went, he said, they're talking about me. He doesn't even care if you curse him. He loves the attention. He takes it as Satan worship. I don't say anything about the forked tongue rascal. I, I don't preach on him. I, don't, I try my best to ignore him. But he wants the attention. He wants you to name him and talk about him and study him. And, and, and so you have all these seminars on, a, on drugs and on sexual perversion and on Satanism and demonology. And I, Paul said, I'd rather you be simple about sin. Said you need to be wise about righteousness. Yeah. Well, say amen right there. Yeah. Spend our time studying something that'll amount to a hill of beans after a while. Amen. Yeah. amen. Some folks wouldn't like heaven because of the sovereign rule and others wouldn't like heaven because it's too loud. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's too much racket. And because you can't sleep. Honey, you won't be tired. No. Yeah. So when I get to heaven, I'm going to have that song go, 
sit down and rest a little while. Yeah, I was going to sit down and rest. Oh, honey, you ain't going to sit down and rest a little while. Oh, no, that's the last thing in the world. I mean, you're going to be too busy loving the Lord, and you're going to be too busy fellowshipping with the people of God. I was over in, I was over in, uh, my, my, the Jamestown flood. That's a Pennsylvania, isn't it? The Jamestown. Yeah, I was over there in Jamestown flood looking where they had the flood, and, and they have a little museum telling all about that. And, and uh, they said this fellow, uh, that uh, said this fellow died in the flood. That was a horrible thing. And so uh, they said this fellow survived the flood. It washed him down the river, tore his clothes off, skinned him all up. He climbed out on the bank. I mean, just came that close to losing his life, but he survived it. And during that time, he called on the Lord and was gloriously saved. And so he was a member of the First Baptist Church there in that town. So he went, said he went to the, to the pastor and said, uh, said, so I got saved out of the flood and said, I want to give my testimony. He said, but, but we have a schedule. And he said, they just, it just won't fit in. But he said, it, maybe it will in a couple of weeks. And, and it never did. And he said, well, I'll tell you what. said, see if you can give it in Sunday school. And so he went to Sunday school teacher and said, I, I am, am one of the very few that survived that flood. And he said, I want to give my testimony in Sunday school. Well, he said, I, we're interested and that's good. And it's a miracle of God. But he said, time we review the ball scores and talk about the weenie roast and the social and the horseshoe pitching contest. We just don't have time. But, and said that finally the old boy died. And so when he got to heaven, the angel was telling him about heaven. And, and that old boy said, let me ask you a question, angel. He said, you asked me, I'm the man, I know. He said, y'all have any testimonies up here? He said, testimonies? Man, what do you think we do all the time? He said, well, I, he said, I, I'm one of the survivors of the Jamestown. He said, yeah, I heard about that. He said, well, I want to give my testimony. He said, you can. He said, look out there. He said, they was it was just like an endless golf course, beautiful, beautiful green. And he said there was millions of people out there, uh, all over the place out there. And he said, you see that big man, that man down on that big rock? And he said he looked down there, and there was a great big stone. There was a man up on it with a long white beard. He said, you just go right down there, and you can give your testimony about how you came out of the flood. He said, as a matter of fact, he said, I'll just call down there. and said, you're next. He said, well, who's that man testifying? He said, that's Noah. <laughs> But we'll have a chance to tell our story and we'll be able to testify and talk to one another and, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you how I got in and you can tell me how you got in and we can just rejoice because it was Jesus that let us in, amen. amen. He's the way, the truth, and the life. He's the door, thank God. He loves every seed of Adam's race. I don't care what you've done, who with, what for, or how many times Jesus loves you tonight and he'll save you if you'll come to him. He'll save you, he'll save you. He's the... He's the only one that can. <laughs> oh, I know y'all laugh at the way I talk. I do. I laugh at it too. This, uh, but there's some words in the King, in the English that we have in the Blue Ridge, and y'all don't have up here. And I try to, you know, I want to communicate the truth in love, so I try to dodge those words. Y'all don't know that. But, uh, but a uh, uh, few years ago, they came out with that Jesus Christ superstar, you know, and it said Jesus is the greatest. And old Tom Hayes said, Jesus is not the greatest. And someone said, he is. He said, no, he's not the greatest. He said, he doesn't have a rival. Yeah, right, right. He said, he doesn't have a, a, a it, there's no basis of comparison. Right. In order to be the greatest, you have to be compared to someone and you're better or bigger or stronger. And said, Jesus, he said, Jesus doesn't even have an opposite. Yeah. Right. He said, if the devil if the devil has an opposite, it's Michael or Gabriel. It's not Jesus. Amen. And old Tom lived around Silver, North Carolina, around Bryson City in there, you know. He said, man, Jesus ain't the greatest. He's the onlyest. Yeah. Amen. 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 That's, a good, that's a good word too, buddy. Amen. He's not the greatest. He's the only one of, of the kind. He, he is the onlyest. How about that, Yankee? Amen. He is not the greatest. He is the onlyest. He's the virgin-born son of God. Don't you love him tonight? And when we come together, we ought to be ashamed of him. We ought to praise him. We ought to thank God for being so good to us. And don't get too excited now. You're just saved forever. 
Amen. 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 Some folks wouldn't. I've got to go on. Now in chapter 5 and verse number 9, uh, some folks wouldn't enjoy heaven because of the sovereignty and some wouldn't enjoy heaven because of the shouting. And others wouldn't, that's it, verse 9, others wouldn't enjoy heaven because of the songs. And they sung a new song. Boy, you'd like to go to the Psalms and preach about David's new song, wouldn't you? Now, if you're saved, he's changed your attitude. He's changed your outlook. He's changed your hangouts and your habits and your friends. He's given you new friends, new family, and a new future. Amen. Amen. But he's not through changing you till he changes your song. I wonder if we went outside right now and turned on your Volkswagen, turned on that ignition. I wonder what channel your radio's on. I wonder if you've been listening to that rock, bop, and slop. You've been listening to Wailing Jenny and the Boys. Been listening to Tammy the Wynette and Dolly Parton. I wonder if you're into country music or rock music or that old sophisticated, classy stuff. I wonder if you listen to real Christian music that glorifies. Don't you realize how important music is to a child of God? Why don't you go back, go back and study how all this came about? Music was created for worship. That's the on, onlyest thing it was created for was worship. I mean, you go back and find me. And so the devil always has a counterfeit. I mean, you'll come along with a counterfeit. And so God is the author of music. He's the, he's, he's the rhythm and the rhyme and he's the timing and he's the tune. And, and, and God gave us music that we might worship him in song. And it's a wonderful thing and a beautiful thing. And then here comes the devil. She loves me, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so here comes the world, and the world comes in then with its music. Listen, you better watch that stuff. Now, I, I know that last psalm, that Psalm 150, it describes every known instrument of that day. And David made those instruments, and, and he learned how to play them, and he taught others how to pick them and blow them and, 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 all, and the tambourine and all that and the cymbals and all those things. Listen, friend, all of that is he said, take these, take these and worship God. And so there's nothing wrong with music. Amen. And these people, these so-called Church of Christ, which is not a church, nor is it of Christ. Yeah, that's right. It's like grape nut flakes. <laughs> but that out, and they say it's wrong. They say it's wrong to bring musical instruments into the house of God. And they say they're against this, they're against, they go, oh, honey, we ought to just let God sanctify that thing and make sure that it's used to glorify God and praise God and then let her rip, amen. Yeah. Go right ahead, if you can toot it, toot it. If you can strum it, strum it. But you better watch that beat. Yeah. Yeah. You see, that came right from hell through Africa right into the Baptist church. Yeah. That's why when some of the teenagers come down the street, you can hear them before you see them. They go boom, 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 boom. How in the world does their eardrums survive such as that? Boom, 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 boom. And now we have a group of people now that think that if the lyrics is good, and if the lyric is about Jesus, then the lyric sanctifies the beat. The lyric doesn't sanctify the beat. You watch out for that stuff. I mean, it'll get you. I, I remember Olford back in the 60s was talking about how that he grew up in, in North Africa. And he said there was a little short African there that was the best there was on the drums. And he said the drums down there were kind of like uh, bongos. And he said, you can't get it out of them. It's just in them. And so he said he would gather around and they'd do, do the limbo and do the dance and all that. And you want me to show you? He'd do all that and said that old boy... He said that old boy was the best there was at be beating those drums. And he said, I was there. And he said, I saw him just go into a trip. He said, I don't think he was on any kind of a hallucinating drunk. But he said, I saw him just fading out on those drums. And his eyes was walled back, all black in his head on those drums, on these drums. Then he said, I saw blood coming off of his fingernails. But he said, he just kept on, he kept on. He said, he did that all night. He took a trip on that music and he beat those drums all night. He said in a couple of days his hands were all swollen. 
said his fingers were almost as big as an ear of corn. And he said he got gangrene and he lost those fingers. He said it was a great joy years later after he got saved to see him taking up the offering and holding the offering plate between those two stubs. But his point was that it's evil. That beat is of the devil. That, that, that African beat is of the devil. And we don't need that in the Baptist church. I don't care if you are singing Amazing Grace. You better leave that boom, boom, boom somewhere else. Let the devil have that mess. Amen. Amen. But the Word of God would show us how we can blow the trumpet and play the fiddle. Well, he might think that's a violin, but I know what it is. But that's Amen. a fiddle. and play the guitar. And if you're afraid of stringed instruments, you ought to look in the back of that piano. Thank God, take these things and praise the Lord. As a matter of fact, he even likes cymbals. Amen. Buddy, I don't. <laughs> Why, you can't pick them and you can't tune them and you can't sing, with, who how can you sing with a cymbal? Clang, 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 clang. But he likes them. He said to praise them on the cymbals. He said, then praise him on the high-sounding symbols. He mentioned symbols twice in that psalm. He didn't mention other things but one. He likes them. He said, I don't like them old symbols. Well, we didn't come here to worship you. So I don't like them old horns and them old violins and all that. Man, we didn't come to worship you. We came to worship him. Amen. Amen. Want to go down to the, to the pawn shop or to the army surplus and get us a big old set of marching cymbals and hide them around here somewhere. You know, don't play them every service. Just kind of hide them around here somewhere. And then when the Lord comes through and saves some precious soul, you ought to get them things that go. <laughs> Why? Just because yeah. God likes them. Amen. Yeah. Because God likes them. I don't like them. And if your pastor's normal, he don't like them. But we're not here to worship Rufus and we're not here to worship the man of God. We're here to worship the God of the man of God. We're here to worship heaven. Amen. Thank God for Jesus. Hallelujah. We're here to worship him and praise him. Some folks wouldn't like heaven because they, they, they like them secular songs. You see, music is created for worship. And all you have to do to get involved in Satan worship you don't have to go to some black, some black magic or some seance or some Ouija board party or something. All you have to do is just listen to rock and roll music. All you have to do is just listen to country music. All you have to do is just, because you see, music was created by God to worship Him. And so when we get involved in, now I know that there's patriotic things and probably that are kind of in between, but when it comes to music, it's for praise. And so if you want to get involved in Satan worship, all you got to do is just turn on the secular radio station, listen to some country music, listen to some, some light rock. Just like light beer, it'll still make you drunk, won't it? Amen. 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 You love your mother-in-law, say amen. amen. <laughs> Some folks wouldn't like heaven because of the songs. Honey, they'll not be singing Elvis Presley songs in heaven. That's right, that's right. Okay? Right, right. Now, I loved old Elvis and Jerry Lee Lewis and all them boys of that day, old Roy Orbison and all that. But you see, those folks didn't know God. You're in trouble if all your heroes are cowboys. Poor old Elvis. I wish he had got saved. He read his Bible every day. His favorite singing group was the Kingsmen. He had auditioned one time to join the Kingsmen. They said, man, you can't sing. Go back to Mississippi and drive that truck. <laughs> That's what they told Elvis. Then a couple years after that, Elvis got behind him in that old 57 GMC diesel and pulled him over, and, and Elvis got out of his bus and got in with the Kingsmen and went down the road and sang together. He was a good old boy, good-natured. Everyone liked Elvis. And, and, and they found him, when they found him, his sitting on the commode dead and had a King James Bible in his lap. But you see, the problem, Maze Jackson's boy, Maze's boy interviewed him. And he said, I love the Bible and I love gospel music. And he said, I think I know God. But he said, I don't believe in Jesus Christ and never have and never will. <laughs> that just make your heart sick. It's Jesus or it's hell. It's Jesus or it's hell. 
The same Bible that says he is the way says he's the only way. He's the only way. There's no other, there's no other plan of salvation but the Bible plan of salvation. The precious Jews have everything they need but the blood. You mark her down, it's Jesus. If you want to go to heaven, Jesus is the way to go to heaven. And if you don't get in with him, you ain't getting in. He's the way. He's the way. He said there's no man, no man, no man, doesn't matter what nationality, there's no man comes to the Father but by me. Don't you love him? Don't you appreciate him? Amen. Yeah. I want everybody to be saved, but I'll tell you it's Jesus or it's hell. Well, let's see over here in chapter 6. Some folks wouldn't want to go to heaven because of the shouting. And some folks wouldn't go, want to go to heaven because of the songs. And then some folks wouldn't like heaven because of the suits. <laughs> chapter 6, verse 11. And white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren should be killed as their work should be fulfilled. Isn't that precious? I knew you'd love that. Look in uh, chapter 7 at verse 9. After this I beheld in law a great multitude which no man could number out of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne. That's us, friend. Did John see you there? I mean, he said all nations and kindreds and people. Oh, that's wonderful. All the, the scope of the, and the magnitude of the invitation of the Lamb of God every kindred and every tribe and every tongue and every nation. Thank God, saved by the blood. That's wonderful. That is, that is wonderful. Amen. It said, uh, no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white, what is that? Robes. And palms in their hand and cried with a loud voice, you see, honey, you, we're heading to a place where we're going to be praising Him and worshiping Him. Amen? And I'm not talking about a bunch of junk. I'm not talking about some kind of a circus. But I'm talking about people that are not ashamed of the Lord. Amen. Not ashamed of Him. Not ashamed to name the mighty name. Not ashamed to identify with the people of God. So I'm a worshiper of Christ. I don't get excited over the ball game or the racetrack but I'll tell you one to talk about my Jesus. It gives me chill bumps. I'm, I'm a worshiper of God. Are you still with me? Amen. You, you still want to go to heaven? Amen. Look, look what we're going to do. He said, and cried with a loud voice. Now, that's what the Bible said. A loud voice saying, salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and befell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and, and might be in. Now you see, you say you want to go to heaven, but you ought to get, you ought to get in context here. Some of you are so dry when when you get to heaven, they're going to put you in shouting class. <laughs> going to enroll you in, in uh, you right there on the end. They're going to, they're going to enroll you in worship 101. <laughs> Some of y'all laughing are dry as he is. <laughs> and see, we're going to be out there shouting and praising the Lord and worshiping him with all of our heart. And they're, going, and they're going to say, where's George? And they say, he's in shouting class. <laughs> I, want to get, I want to get practiced up. Amen. Amen. George, I want to get practiced up. I want to learn how to worship him. Worship him. Holy, holy, holy. Amen. I want to get a, a divorce from public opinion. Amen. <laughs> I want to get, that's the only kind of divorce I believe in. I want to get a divorce from public opinion. And then I want to get a case of I can't help it. And then I want to get a double dose of I don't care. Amen. Amen. Let's go ahead and worship the Lord and say glory and honor and majesty and power. And while I'm doing that, you'll be somewhere in an old dry shouting class. But I believe if we fall in love with him down here and get over our inhibitions and get over our 
our backwardness and our old dryness and stop blaming it on your temperament and your nature and say, well, I'm just, my mother was like this. She's dry high too, wasn't she? And we need to get over all that. I mean, I know some of us have a different temperament, and some of you are shy, but praise God, when you're saved, you have a new nature, a divine nature, and you can, you, you still have the old nature, but you can yield yourself to that divine nature, and the Spirit of God is interested in praising Jesus, and the main job of the Holy Spirit is to bring sinners to Christ, and the second job of the Holy Spirit is to brag on Jesus, amen. That's what the Holy Ghost will do. He'll brag on the Lamb of God, amen, and when you're filled, you are controlled Amen. by the Holy Spirit. And so if you're controlled, now deacons are not qualified, preachers are not qualified unless they're filled with the Holy Spirit. And that word filled means control. And I'll guarantee you, honey, I'll guarantee you, if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you'll be worshiping Jesus. Amen. Saying, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered and said to me, what are these which are arrayed in white? Uh, there's that word again, robes. And which come? And I said to him, Sir, thou knowest. He said unto me, These are they which came out of the great tribulation, and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Amen. Some folks wouldn't like heaven because of the suit. Well, you know, God doesn't describe or arrange or, or or go into detail about a lot of our clothing uh, except places like this. Of course, in Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve, the fall, the fig leaves, you know that passage. And then it said, and the Lord clothed them in yeah, most churches don't remember that. Coats of skin. So we have coats and we have robes. Say it with me. Coats, robes. Say again. Coats, robes. Y'all folk get the idea? Now we have that linen he fought and the things that he described for the, for the priest. But Christian men and women ought to be careful what they wear. Especially in these days of perversion. See, you're living in a day when you beautiful ladies, if you're not dressed just right, some old wicked, filthy man will lust after you. And Jesus said he'll commit adultery with you. Sounds like you're involved in that thing. Wouldn't it be something to go to the judgment seat of Christ and know that you had never been involved with anyone but your husband and get there and find out that you're guilty of adultery a thousand times? In that you drew the attention of some old wicked, devil-possessed man and some of you men go to work in the summertime, take your shirt off. You don't have any more right to go topless than your wife has to go topless. Amen. Keep your clothes on. Now you study First Timothy, and he'll talk about women adorning themselves in modest apparel. That word modest is not the one that'll get you. It just means covered. But it does mean covered. But that word apparel means a long, flowing, let down garment. Honey, that ain't blue jeans. That long flowing, and y'all have been so precious, and and uh, I've noticed all week how modest and how pretty that you dress and come to the house of God. I wonder how you dress when you go to Walmart or down to the local drag race. I might have said this already. I I don't try to remember. It. I'm just saying that that it's your body that's the tabernacle of the Holy Spirit, where where you're at the house of God or not. So I don't like him old robes and them old coats. Well, take it up with him. Now, he's, he's the one that said it. No, nah, you wouldn't fit. I can tell you. <laughs> Some folks wouldn't enjoy heaven because of the services. I'm trying to close. I'm trying to close. I'm trying to close now. Skip on down in that same chapter. Is it chapter 7? Skip on down to verse 15. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night. It's enough of that. Isn't it? Day and night. You say, oh, I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. I wanna, I, I'm saved. I want to go to And you won't come to Wednesday night prayer meeting. That's right. I mean, you're trying to tell me now. You, you're trying to tell me now that, uh, I mean, I was born in the country, but I wasn't born yesterday. 
You're trying to tell me that you love the Lord and you want to go to heaven where you can be in a service all the time, but you don't want to come to Wednesday night prayer meeting. Right. And you want me to believe that? Huh? I mean, you don't want to serve the Lord. You're a hitchhiker. I mean, you come in and you complain about the air or the pew or the parking and you won't tithe. And if anyone ever votes against doing something with the church's money, it's usually some hypocrite that don't give. And we want to come to the house and say, oh, I love him and I want to go to heaven. Well, honey, in heaven, we're going to be worshiping and in heaven, we're going to serve him day and night. In heaven, we're going to look right act right, walk right, in heaven we're going to praise him right, and, it, and you say, that's where I want to go, but you don't want to do it down here. I just, I'll be honest with you, I just have a problem with that. Because uh, he's getting us ready. And if you don't enjoy the things that will be going on in heaven, I don't think you're going. I don't, I don't think you're saved. If you don't enjoy doing right, serving him, and worshiping him, and Looking right. I don't think you're going. I don't know. I just don't think you're going. You're going somewhere. A fellow told me at the mall, he said, religion ain't my thing. No, my bag. He said, religion just ain't my bag. He said, I'm not again it. No, no, I'm not again it. He said, it just ain't my bag. He said, I guess I'm just neutral. And I thought, boy, I wish, I wish that was, I wish that fly, but it won't. But I mean, I wish there, because there are a lot of folk, there are a lot of good folk. I mean, good neighbors, good citizens, good soldiers, good folk. As far as living, you know, above the law and being generous, and there's a lot of fine people that are not saved. Some of them have clean language, good attitude, good to work around. I wish there was something like that. But see, I can't find it. We don't have a right to go create another category. Well, Paul said before you're saved, you're the enemy of God. <laughs> Every friend Jesus has is a former enemy. I mean, you're either for him or you're against him. You're going to heaven or you're going to hell, one or the other. No purgatory or limbo or anything else. You... You, you either saved or you're lost. Isn't that sad? Now, wouldn't it be good if mean, wicked, perverted, child molesting, murdering thugs would go to hell? And saints of God go to heaven, and then the rest of them just die like an animal and deteriorate and it's over? But it's fine, wouldn't it? I'd go for it. But that's not the way the Bible reads. It don't matter if you're an old, wicked, drug taking, liquor drinking, hell raising pervert or not. You can be a clean, outstanding, good person and be just as lost as that drunk. It's just the way it is. I'd be telling you a lie if I told you anything else. You're going to heaven. Hey, you're going to heaven or, or you're going to hell. It's heaven or it's hell. It's heaven or it's hell. You are going. It's out of your control. It's heaven or it's hell. And what you do with Jesus now determines what he'll do with you. Right. Let's stand, please, and bow our heads. How about it? Now, that's why we're here. That's why this church is here. That's why Pastor Hammett is here. That's why the school's here. It's why the Bible Institute's here. That's why we have a revival service. It's because every seed of Adam's race has eternal life. You are stuck with it. It's where will you spend it. It's, will you, it'll never be spent. It's where will you be a million years from now. It's not that some live forever. We all live forever. But will you, where will you be in a million years? Will you be happy? Will you be singing? While ages roll throughout eternity, I'm asking the question, where will you be? It's either Jesus or it's hell. If you'll come to him tonight with an attitude that says, I'm sorry, I've sinned, and I know I've sinned. I deserve to go to hell, and I'm sorry for my sin, and I want to be saved. 
I want Jesus to forgive me and be my Savior. I want to submit my life to him. Honey, if you can come to him like that tonight, it'll make the difference between heaven and hell. You see, he's not looking for some little detail. He's not looking for some way to keep from saving you. He wants to save you. He's anxious to save you. He will save you. He wants to save you. He'd be delighted to save you. But you have to furnish him with the sinner. He won't run you down, twist your arm. He just gives you an invitation. He says, come, but you don't have to. But you'll wish you had. Won't you come? Heavenly Father, please give a personal invitation to the lost sinner. And Lord, you know tonight those who are here who are saved, but they just don't really have a heavenly lifestyle and, and they're not really into really submitting to you and worshiping you and giving to missions and witnessing and handing out tracts and and they think that's left up to the missionary or the evangelist or the pastor or the staff. But Lord, show us that, that we're your army. And we're all the people that you want to use for your glory to spread the message. There are some here that are not a very good advertisement down there where they work. They frown and growl and complain. And, and there's really no way they can be an effective witness because their life has sealed their lips. They can't really say much about Christ because they set such a sorry example. And I pray you'd help such a Christian to come to this altar tonight and say, Lord, I want to get out of business at serving you. I, I know you saved me. I know that. But I'm just a sorry example of what grace can do. And I want to yield my life to you tonight. I want you to fill me with happiness and joy and peace and, and, and help me not just to do some witnessing, but help me to be a witness. I know I'm saved, Lord, but I want to just surrender my life to you tonight, and I want you to fill me with joy and give me such a, a personality and a positive mindedness that folks could see Jesus in me. Lord, help us tonight. So we ask you now, Heavenly Father, to help that Christian that's cold and indifferent, and then we ask you, Heavenly Father, to help that poor lost sinner. So precious, you died for them just like they were the only person. Not just one drop, but you died for that person. Show them that. May the Holy Spirit reveal to them the wonderful love of God in them and the, the desperate situation they're in, that they'd come and trust Jesus tonight. Have mercy upon us and help us. Now, heads are bowed and eyes are closed, and you need to be coming. Scores of you need to come tonight. And perhaps it's something the Lord said to you a month ago, but come tonight. Lay your life on this altar tonight. Mean business. Don't you dare walk that aisle unless you mean it. Mean business tonight. Won't you come? Won't you come? Won't you come? Won't you come? Ask God to transform your life and your personality so that, that you look like you're headed for heaven. That you look like you've already had a taste of heaven. And that you look like you'd fit in in heaven. Won't you come? Now the altar's about full, but there's room for you. Now on this front pew, there's some room. And on that one. Come on. And then in this middle, this middle aisle, sing for us, dear brother. Won't you come? We're going to have prayer with these who come. If you're in the altar, stay in the altar. I must needs go home. Stay in the altar and pray. If you finish praying for yourself, pray for someone else. There's no other way. That's it. Come on. We're going to have a prayer meeting. Come on. I shall never catch Lord, bless that woman. Help the that real woman. Dear God, help her. If the way of the cross I miss, the way of the cross. That's it, men. Come on. Just bow before the Savior. Bow before the Savior. He loves you tonight. Now, He knows more about you than you know about yourself. But He still loves you. He still loves you. We're going to pray just in a moment. Sing one more time, brother, one more. We're going to have prayer with these that have come. go on in the blood-sprinkled way, the path that the Savior trod. If I ever climb to the heights sublime where the soul is at home with God. Can you leave now? Are you satisfied? 
Have you obeyed the Lord? Stay in the altar if you can. Our pastor is going to pray, or he'll lead. He'll ask someone to lead in prayer. Sweet to know as I onward go, the way of the cross. Stay in the altar if you can. Now heads are bowed and eyes are closed, and I want to thank you for being so precious and cooperative. And I want to ask a question, and I hope this doesn't offend anyone. But heads are bowed and eyes are closed. How many people tonight? Not in the altar now, but back there in, in the pew. How many of you could say, Preacher, as far as I know, I've obeyed the Lord tonight. As far as I know, I've, I've not quenched His Spirit. Could I see your hand? I can leave this building right now. God bless you, sir. God bless this man. Lord, help him. Help him, Lord. Fill him with Jesus. You, you say, I can leave this building and, and drive down the road in my automobile right now, and I can know that I obeyed the Lord and, and everything that he impressed me to do in the service, I did it. Let me see your hand. Let's put them up again. Everyone that can, don't you lie now. Don't lie to them. Thank you. That's wonderful. And really, that's about three quarters. Thank you. That's about 75% of the people. You can put your hands down. Heavenly Father, please help no one to be offended. And I want to thank you, Lord, for these precious, honest souls. They, they were searching for you to tell them to do something, and they would have obeyed you. But there's about 50 out there, Lord, that couldn't raise their hand. And our pastor's going to pray in a moment, and, and Lord, please help. There's some teenagers, some of them are grandparents, and they didn't lift their hand. They're, maybe they're just not sure, but it could be that you're, that you're putting some thoughts in their mind and you're tugging at their heart. And there's some area of their life that they haven't really submitted to you. Help them, Lord. And give them strength and give them grace. You know how hard it is to step out and walk that aisle, Lord. Give them grace. Give them strength. And then some that didn't lift their hand, it's because they're lost. And they could be screaming in hell before midnight tonight. Before midnight. And at the memorial service, there might be some nice things said about them, but they'd be screaming in hell during their own funeral. Lord, help them to come. Help them to flee the wrath to come. Help them to turn their back on the devil and his lies and his filth and his lies and, and come to Jesus and be forever saved. Please help us. Please let us have one more verse, my brother. That first verse. And let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Won't you come? We're giving you this opportunity. Won't you come? I must needs go home by the way of Stay in the altar if you can. There's We're going to pray no right here in a minute. If you can, just stay in the altar. This. I shall never get sight of the gates of light if the way of the cross I miss. The way of the cross leads well, what do you think? home. The way it's either of the cross Jesus leads or it's hell. Home. That's all there is. is sweet to know if you have a desire in your heart to be saved, that's Him. The way of the cross leads home. All right, thank you for staying in the altar, and let's pray and pray one for another. Our pastor's going to lead us, or he'll call on someone. Stay as you are, please. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Exactly what 